Hey guys, Lonnie, Real Alcoholic here. Alright, getting into chapter 3, more about alcoholism. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholic. Except for Lonnie. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. And this great obsession to con control and enjoy my drinking... I I chase that obsession since my first drink. You know that that first ah that that peace, that comfort uh that I got and and I got that, man. I really did. Um up until the end uh, with my fifth between my legs driving driving to the emergency room to the second detox I had to go through. Man, I still got that Ah, it worked, right? Um, the only thing that did not work was I could not control and enjoy my drinking. Um, the, the physical craving that this doctor talked about, I had to fully concede. I had to finally learn that I have a medical condition. I get this physical cra craving that even though alcohol did to me what it does to other people... It gives other people that sense of ease and comfort, right? Um, but they can they can stop or they can moderate. For us alcoholics, we could not and I could not. So I had this obsession, right, that I was going to control and enjoy my drinking. That's the obsession that gets lifted. Um, you know, it's this, this physical condition we have uh, of our chemical makeup in our body. Uh, that doesn't change. This obsession of the mind. This is where we have this psychic change, man. Um, and that obsession gets removed. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. Smashed. This is why, this is why, you know, we've got, we've got seven chapters to describe these 12 steps and what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is. And four of those chapters are on steps one and two. Um, that's how important, th this is how much they're trying to smash this idea that we could ever control or enjoy our drinking. And I, I'm going to say for me personally, that admitting I was admitting I had a drinking problem, admitting I was probably alcoholic because I drank like you guys did, um, admitting that when I drank I got into some shit. It it was a slight difference than this word accepting it, right? Um, to accept that I am fully, fully. 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt, I have a condition called alcoholism. You know, I, I don't think it really hit me or it really didn't hit my heart until I went to treatment this last time and I started reading this book again. And when I fully conceded to concede, I, I tapped out, man. I, I just, um, I accepted it. I fully conceded in my heart that I'm an alcoholic, and I'm a real alcoholic. I cannot play with it. This delusion that I will ever be like my neighbors next door, or this delusion that I will ever be like the person I see that can party, 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 and and never have any problems. This delusion that I am my my body is made like other people. Um, that has to be smashed, man. This delusion, uh, I, I had convinced myself that somehow, someday, I would beat this game. And I tried every 
everything I thought I could possibly try to control and enjoy my drinking. And it just never worked. So it says, we know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. This is suggesting that um, that our progressive illness, once we once we cross that invisible line where liquor is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Once we once we are um, alcoholic, some of us start out from our first drink alcoholic, and it seems like others grow into it slowly. But either way, it's progressive and it's deadly. And the only solution is entire abstinence. Okay. Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are not going to believe they're in that class by every form of self-deception and experimentation. They will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. How many times did, did we try? I mean, I tried and tried. I was just going to drink with good people. I was just going to drink with wine. I thought I had found the magic cure with E&J brandy mixed with iced tea. Um, I was only going to drink on the weekends. Um, I wasn't going to do this. I, I was going to do that. And none of that ever worked. I never could control and enjoy my drinking. Okay, page 32. Page 32 is telling us, um, well, it starts on page 31. It's given us this experiment for people to diagnose themselves. Uh, step over to the nearest bar room. Go to your house, whatever you need to do, um, and try to control your drinking. If you haven't tried it before, try it. Man, take a few drinks. Take two, take three, set yourself a limit, uh, only three drinks uh, tonight. And, and it won't take long for you to decide if you are honest with yourself about it. It will be worth a bad case of the jitters if you get full knowledge of your condition. And the full knowledge they're wanting us to get is to experience this craving. You know, like I said, in 2017, I was riding around drinking and driving and after the second drink, I felt that craving. Something happened in me. A switch went off where I knew that was it. I had crossed the line and I was going to continue drinking till I passed out. And, and so to get a full knowledge of my condition, that's not going to, that's not going to keep me from drinking forever, but it's definitely a good a good foundation stone. It's definitely a good start where I can honestly tell myself in 2017, yes, I know what that craving feels like. I've experienced it. It made sense. It took me two years later before I finally put myself in, in a hospital. But today, looking back, I can say, yes, I know what that insatiable craving for more alcohol feels like. Um, uh, so this next little highlight here is once he started, he had no control whatsoever. This is, this is our, um, this is our common bond. This is our common, um, disease. This fact that once we start we have no control whatsoever. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we're in a short time as bad as ever. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. So I bring this and I highlight this and I try to smash home that this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
um, if a person's not convinced that they can never ever drink again the rest of their life, I, I don't think we're going to be very successful. I know I wasn't until I had fully conceded, until I fully accepted this condition called alcoholism and that I have it. Um, it was, it was no longer about stopping drinking to, um, to find some success in life, some success in relationships, right? This was a medical condition and my only treatment is complete abstinence. And that's for the rest of my life. It's not one day at a time. It's not, I'm going to try this for 90 days. And if I don't like it, um, I can always go back to drinking. I don't play around with it. And in chapter seven, we'll clearly see um, that this commitment, this decision in the first step, uh, that's a lifetime decision. And and that's hard, man. That's hard for a lot of us. To, I just can't possibly see how I can go the rest of my life without a drink. What's life going to be like? Um, man, we feel like we're losing our best friend. You know, we can't think that far ahead. Well, it tells me clearly right here that if I'm planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation, none, no reservation of any kind that for the rest of my life, I cannot drink alcohol. And that decision needs to be made in this first step. And we're going to see that in chapter seven more uh, when we're working with others. Okay, so now we're getting into some young people and we're talking about um, sometimes some, somebody young in their disease, right? Not just necessarily age, but, but the progression of disease. Sometimes they can stop on their own willpower. Um, that depends, we'll read later, that depends if this person had the, to the extent that they have already lost control. Um, once we have placed ourselves beyond human aid, um, it's going to take this program to maintain some sobriety. It's telling us in these paragraphs that some people in the early stages of alcoholism, they can catch it, really don't need a big spiritual experience. Um, they can catch it and still have some willpower and decide, man, it's best for my life if I just never drink again. But not for many. Most of us have this particular mental twist already acquired. And so most of us in a short time, it says we turn into the real thing. You know, Bill W. talked in, about himself when he was in college. He was going to school, the potential alcoholic that I was, all right? There's no doubt. There's no doubt Bill had alcoholism. There's no doubt he was fighting his drinking problem uh, in college. This particular mental twist was already established. And it goes on to tell us that, that some people often turn into the real thing in a short time. Um. It doesn't, there's no time limit on when a person loses this control. There's no time limit to when this craving gets so insatiable in a person that they absolutely cannot stop by their own willpower and just by simply making a decision. This is bad for me. I'm not going to do it. Um, there's no time limit on that. This craving, this craving is, it's cunning, baffling, and powerful, and it kicks in, and it starts at different stages in, in our drinking career, but once we have, once we have crossed that line into not being heavy drinkers, um, we cross that line into real alcoholism, where we absolutely cannot stop once we start, and we can't stay stopped because of the particular obsession this particular mental twist that happens to us. Suggesting people stop for one year. Man, don't even come to the program. You don't like God? That's fine. Just stop for a year. Well, if he's a real alcoholic, he or she probably cannot do that. 
Okay, so some unmanageability here. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Let's read that again. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Some people don't need a spiritual basis. Some people do not need these 12 steps. Some people do not need a psychic change. Um, the spiritual experience we talk about, this process we talk about, some people don't need it. It all depends upon the extent to which they have lost the power to choose whether they will drink or not. Um, in the chapter to the wives, we won't read it. You can read it on your own. But it goes through four stages of alcoholism. Uh, it starts with husband number one, husband number two, husband number three. We get to husband number four, and this guy's in the very last stages. We're going to lock him up or he's going to die. And so our, our spiritual dependence when it comes to recovery really does depend on the extent to which we lost the power to choose. People early in their sobriety may not need such a quite um, uh, intensive uh, spiritual program. They might be able to just join a good fellowship with non-drinkers, join a book club, um, come to AA meetings and not really have any spiritual experience, and they can stay sober. Still alcoholic, no doubt. Okay, I'm not... I'm not I'm not going to dare call anyone non-alcoholic. That's for each individual to decide for themselves. But I can tell you, um, for those of us that have reached this, this invisible line where we placed ourselves beyond human aid, um, the real alcoholic is going to have to have a spiritual experience. There is no doubt about it. So this baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it is this utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity or the wish. This is where we get into that difference where I had every good reason. Y'all heard my story. I had every good reason to quit drinking and to stay quit for the rest of my life. Could not do it no matter how great the necessity or the wish, without these 12 steps, without going through this process, <coughs> excuse me, without having this spiritual experience and this psychic change, without getting a conscious contact, a relationship with my creator, I could not stay stopped. I was a habitual relapser. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a habitual relapser outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, we're going to end there, guys. Um, they want to talk about on page 35 and the second half of more about alcoholism really talks about this mental state. OK, we talked about having the mind of a chronic alcoholic. Because this disease affects our body, it affects our, our mind, our mental process, our thinking process. So they're going to describe to us some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. For obviously, this is the crux of the problem, right? So the problem is, is yes, I mean, Bill W., myself, most of us realize alcohol was our master long time before we accepted this disease or accepted this program. We knew that there was something wrong between us and our drinking. So the crux of the problem is the fact that we continued to try to control and enjoy our drinking. These constant relapses, these habitual relapses. Um, oh, and I love this. And I don't love it, but <clears throat> there's this big saying uh, I hear in AA right now. That, well, 
uh, if you relapsed, it wasn't a relapse because you were never in the program in the first place. Man, a relapse is a relapse. If you quit drinking for a few days and you get yourself detox and you go back to drinking, that's a freaking relapse. There's no other way around it. I, you know, I, I don't know where we're trying to determine what a relapse is or what a relapse is not. Um, a relapse is when when I put my mind to stop drinking, and my mind is convinced I cannot drink, and then I go back to drinking. That is a relapse. So that's the crux of my problem, guys, is I never could get this mental obsession relieved. And the biggest part about this mental obsession is there have been times and there were times and alcohol still towards the very end, even even dying, it gave me peace and comfort. It gave me this mental delusion and this euphoria uh, that I was looking for. And my mental obsession was I was going to control this so that I could continue this euphoria in some shape, manner, or, or fashion, or form. And, and that was the crux of my problem, was to continue to go back to the alcohol and to try to control it. So awesome. Let me upload this one and... Next one, we'll get into the second half of this chapter, and we're going to look at some relapses. And for those of you guys that were like me, some habitual relapsers in this program, I hope it opens up some eyes. I hope it, um, I hope it just really smashes home um, what our problem is and what needs to be done about it. So thanks, guys. Appreciate you, and take it easy. Talk to you later. Bye.